Hey everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. Thank you for joining me. If you're following my lexicon series, this is part eight. And in part eight, it's all about sanding and glazing. And on the surface, maybe these things sound really simple. But like anything, I believe that, you know, what you sand with, how you sand, when you sand, and then with glazing, how you glaze, what colors you use, how thick you put them on, how much you let them set in. So I hope that you will enjoy this little bit longer part eight. I really go into detail about the materials uh, needed that you can use for the sanding as well as for the glazing. And I also kind of give you a preview of how all the paintings are coming along. They're all kind of um, progressing at about the same rate. I hope you enjoy this and please uh, give me a thumbs up if you like the video, if you like the content I provide. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and hit that little notification bell so that you're always notified when I launch a new video. Okay, thanks very much. And here we go. Enjoy part eight. I'm excited because I have made quite a lot of progress on my little panels here. And remember, they all started as slot boards, right? And this one I actually did yesterday. Um, I had two that were, you know, how you, it's just like you've got like, say, eight pieces and two of them are like, yeah, I think I'll do those like last because they're going to be my most, most difficult ones. Well, that actually did happen with me. And I had two problem children because they had colors that weren't in my palette, which, you know, is here. And so what I want to talk about today is um, first give you an update on where my series is and some of the thoughts I've had as I've as I've worked on these slap boards, which is still kind of amazing to me uh, that you can take something so like meaningless, right, as a slap board. Now, this is a new slap board. So in the process of, of working on these eight boards, I've generated two more um, slot boards and I'm pretty sure that they are going to become part of the series. And the reason for that is they've got the same palette. I was so taken by Willa's painting, number one. So the palette for me was like so deep down felt. I watched her paint and she chose these colors and I gave her options. She's only three. She'd say, I want green. Well, which green? Light green, middle green, you know, dark green. And she'd say the white one, which I took to mean the light green, right? So these colors have so much meaning for me because at three years old, she was able to show that she has love and she loves purple, right? That's her favorite color right now. So, so as her grandma, I'm thinking, okay, she chose these colors and as a tribute to my my little bit of time that I spent with her and the painting she did, I'm going to do a series, number one, on those colors. And the impact of that emotional uh, connection, like, and I loved her painting too, um, is that number one, I've, I've now found a palette. And you know what? This palette is one that it is, uh, it's limited. But what I want to say is that it has two sets of complements. It has red and green. Okay, now that... That could be a palette all on its own, just red and green. It also has purple and yellow, another complement. So there are two sets of complements in this palette. Today is all about sanding and glazing. And I just want to show you where I'm at. Uh, these, I'll, these are my two last boards I did yesterday, but I'm going to show you the ones that are, they're, they're kind of like um, quite far along and, and, and I'm quite pleased with them. And I'm not sure how much more I'm going to do with them because there's something about them uh, there's a bit of imperfection here, which I was talking to Lisa. Um, the Japanese heritage is all about perfection. I grew up with that and, and living under that cloud of like everything must be perfect. Um, in my adult life, I fight against. I fight against it tooth and nail. Like I do not, not only do I not want to be perfect, I'm so far from being perfect that um, it makes me happy. Like, you know, so... Um, and that's true in Japanese architecture. I've heard that even though the Japanese are about perfection, they'll leave one little thing off, you know, that is not perfect to say that, you know, it's funny because they're so about perfection, yet they leave a little hint of something that's not perfect. So these are not going to be perfect. Um, they will be clarified to the extent where I want to have them. But am I going to like labor over every little tiny thing that I could make more perfect? No. So this one has obviously letters that I, uh, oftentimes I'll choose letters that are meaningful to me. 
but they also have like a dual meaning, like a W can represent our granddaughter, but it can also be an M. So it can have multiple meanings. And, and for anyone looking at a painting like this, they bring their own uh, life, life story and meaning to a painting like this. And that's why the language to me is so fascinating because um, people have come up to me and, and they'll start telling me what they see in a painting. I'm like, oh, and, and, and they tell me a story about all that it means to them. I'm like, wow, I mean, that's amazing. So anyways, this is one of them. This is a slot board. I don't know. <laughs> you can see the difference. So this is where like something like this would have begun. The point is that this one started very much like this guy. So this right. is one. These are my two slot boards that, um, you know, I will, these will become part of the series. Let's get back to, um, I'm not sure I have them all in front of me. Oh, there's the other ones. Okay. So this one I did yesterday. This is one of the ones that um, was not, um, it was, it was like one of my big problem children because of this very bright purpley pink. That was a hard one. And then this is the other one I did yesterday. And, and the reason I did these yesterday was because I want to show you the sanding. So these don't have, these have not been sanded and they do not have any glaze on them. So these are my two um, demo boards for today. So I've, and I've done all these, like, you know, you guys know when I started this series probably what, two weeks ago or something. And part of what I like about this series is that I am able to get down what I'm trying to say and feel rather quickly. So that's another good indication that you're excited. Uh, if, if, if I were really struggling with this, like, oh my God, I just don't know what to do. That can impact how you feel about something. And I, I sort of feel like, wow, the more excited you are, uh, maybe that's how art becomes more like you're more prolific. You've got momentum. You're excited. Uh, you've got a plan. So some letters here. And I've, I've done both two things here. There's paint and then there's some collage paper. And the reason for using collage paper is not because I am in love with collage. What I'm in love with is what happens when you distress it. Um, it's a little bit higher up in topography. Um, and some papers have texture and I like to, I, I like the weathered feeling, but I don't necessarily want it everywhere. So I let sometimes these raised areas, um, catch the sander. Uh, and so I'll just show you all, all these real fast. They're all, they, some are glossy because they've got gloss medium on them. When they have gloss medium on them, they're ready to go with the glaze. And I'll talk about that too, because that's the topic of today. If they're glossy, they're ready for glaze. If they're like the ones I first showed you, the ones I did yesterday, there's no glaze on here. Um, now you guys might glaze when there's no gloss medium, but I don't. Um, there's a process and my process may differ from yours. So I'd love to know what you do, but um, I'm saving these two as demo boards. So let me just continue to show you the rest of the series. This one uh, glossy, this one could be glazed. Um, this one's glossy. It could be glazed. And I did this one like um, two days ago and it's really weird. And I, I, the other thing I decided or realized about myself is that um, the stranger something is like, this one's just funky weird. I don't even know why I like it. Um, so I find that intriguing. I don't want to know. I almost don't want to know why I like it. I don't need to know why. I just know that weird is good. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about like sanding and glazing. Um, I, I've got these two sample boards here. And the reason why I um, wouldn't just say slap on a glaze and let's talk about what makes great glazes. Um, any color, first of all, can be used as a glaze, but um, you know, colors, professional grade colors usually will tell you on the label whether it's transparent, semi-transparent, opaque, semi-opaque, whatever. That doesn't really even matter because no matter what it is, you can take the most opaque color and you can thin it out with like, now I'm working on acrylic, but the same is true about cold wax and oil. You can thin out an opaque paint. Um, you just use the medium. So I have um, golden airbrush medium is one of my thinners. I have poly, uh, medium golden medium gloss or matte um, liquid here. You can hear it shaking. Those could thin out an opaque color to make it into a glaze. Uh, this is one of my favorites, but I, I just want to explain that um, if you have a series of work and, you know, you, you've got both warm and you've got cool, right? And you kind of want everything to, to have to, I don't know, have like this similar warm glow to it. 
if you put the warm color over even your cool ones, then the cool ones will feel more, more like of the same family as the warm ones, even though it's a cool painting. You can do the same thing with the cool glaze. Now this one's Thalo, and anything with the word Thalo or Windsor um, is a highly potent staining color, and you want to be really careful with how much you put on because if you're not, if you're new to glazing, and you're like, oh, let me try Thalo blue, and you put it like a cup's worth on your painting. Um, that thing is going to go so blue that you're going to be horrified and that wouldn't be great. Same with phthalo green. These are colors that I find hard to love. So if you, if you want to talk about colors that you, that you have, they're like hard to fall in love with. It's because um, they need to be like combined with other colors. Anything, anything will do uh, to make them more lovable. And then another favorite of mine is this quinacridone crimson. So the quinacridones, um, you can kind of see here from the labels um, that Golden has, they put a little uh, swatch um, and over the black lines and you can tell how transparent it is by how much you can see the black lines, which I really appreciate the company doing until you get so much paint on the label that you can't see anything anymore. Uh, so I'm gonna just say that the reason I don't put the, the glaze directly on a painting like this that is not glossy. So this is just paint, some collage paper, and, and that's about it, right? Um, because if I were to put paint on this, there, the, there, it'd be hard to remove enough of the glaze um, and to, to still have like this composition intact. Because what a glaze does is it makes darks go lighter and lights go darker. And a lot of times, if you're not, if you're new to glazing, you're like, oh my gosh, I just totally ruined my painting. Well, the good news is nothing happened. You're fine. Yeah. But there are a couple of things you can do to minimize that horrible heart sinking feeling. That's why, you know, that's the purpose of today is um, I, I, I know that feeling and I, I don't, I don't um, like the feeling. And I, I would assume that other people may, who are new to glazing might not want that feeling as well. So that's why I want to talk about it. So uh, these are the two that don't have any, they have not been sanded and they're not really, in my opinion, ready to be glazed because they don't have that gloss medium or matte medium, doesn't matter which. So then I want to talk about like, well, what do you sand with, right? Um, this one, this little humble sander here is still my favorite of all. I've tried all these things, right? You go to the hardware store, it's like a candy store. And you're like, oh, what about this one? Or, you know, what about a sanding block? Or... Um, I think we were visiting, um, I don't know, we were somewhere, and I, I just went to the hardware store and I found this model. And I, what I liked about it was it has this little doohickey here that, um, oh, yeah, it lifts. You see how it lifts it up? Because one of the things I hate about these types of models is how hard it is to replace the, the sandpaper. Like, I don't know why somebody hasn't come up with a better model of this, because like, I have a hard time getting the paper out and putting it in. Does anyone have that problem with this? If anyone has, has a great way to like put new paper in here easily without like, I mean, I, I have to like lift this darn thing up and it's really hard. Um, and I do cut my paper in advance so that like, at least I have that part done, right? I can, I can replace my paper, but then getting it in there is like, okay, I have to spend the next 10 minutes doing it. It's kind of a pain. So this is my favorite sander um, for small scale. Okay, so it's not that like I do have all these others I've tried, but you know, I'm not real attached to them. Now, if I'm working on, um, and this works on uh, wooden panels, it works on acrylic, it works on cold wax and oil as long as it's completely dry. So um, now I will get out the heavy duty thing here, my Makita, it doesn't have the battery on it, but um, what I like about this model is you can just, it's got Velcro and you can just tear off so that's a lot easier, right? And easy is good. It comes in different grits and you wanna make sure you line up the holes with the sandpaper because the whole point of this is that the dust goes into this little bag and then it means it's capturing most of it and it doesn't go into the air. So I will say for safety purposes that, you know, I'm using a hand sander here and I'll do that this morning. Normally, if, if I ever can, I'll just go outside and do it because I'd rather do that than wear gloves and a mask and goggles. You really want to be careful. I know an artist who was quite well known in Montana and his entire process was 
sanding paper. Gorgeous, gorgeous work. But, you know, he died of a lung disease and they, they kind of mm. thought it was due to the fact that he did so much sanding. So just if you're a big sander, please, please just think about that and protect your health. So um, the other thing to talk about is like, well, what do you sand with in terms of the grit? And so I've got out a couple papers here. These I've pre-cut because this is a common size that I will use. It's a 220. And the higher the number... Uh, the more fine grain it is. So this is a 220. It's pretty fine. This one is a 100, very coarse, like, you know, coarse, like if you're going to sand your barn. Um, now, there might be a time when you would use something that coarse, but I, I got out a variety here just to show you that it does matter what you use. Now, this one's a 150. So this one is um, more coarse than this one. And they get progressively finer. Now, this one is the 220 that I have in my hand. And then this one's the fi finer, fi like 320 is really fine. You can go finer than that, but um, just know the higher the number, um, the finer it is, right? So I'm going to be using 220 today, and that's on this guy. Um, and then you can use steel wool. Uh, this is four knot, and four knot means four zeros, like least amount of um, coarseness. And you can tell by this thing on the bottom here, it's this four. Uh, it's red, and that means that's what this is. It's on my. I think it's on my website, but um, mm -hmm. under the resource thing, Makita XOB01. But I like this one because it's handheld. It's got the little baggie on the end, which you can easily pop off and dump out and then um, switch out the sandpaper easily with Velcro. So for all those reasons, I, I love the Makita and it does have a rechargeable battery. When I sand, um, you know, yeah, how coarse is the sandpaper? That's important to know, but, and I've got collage paper on here. Sometimes it goes over the, the end of the board and I, I do try to cut that off, um, you know, pretty much with the blade before I sand, just because if you catch the edge of collage paper, um, it can it can tear it a little bit, especially if you didn't quite glue it on really well. So those are some things to check for before you start sanding. And then, like, I'll just look at the board, and you know, you don't have to sand over the whole thing. There could be areas that you just don't want to sand. But for me, like, I've got collage paper here, and I mentioned that one of the reasons I like collage paper is because it is raised up a hair, right? It's not not raised up too much. So. Um, I'm going to just take the sander and kind of in a circular motion. Um, it's already like you can already see, oh my gosh, right there. You can already see like with hardly any effort at all, it's starting to um, hit that sand, the paper here. And that tells me how fragile it is. Now, the other thing I want to mention is I do sand collage paper before I put the gloss medium on. And I make a big deal about this in all my videos because once you put the gloss medium on here, let's say I put the gloss medium on my collage paper before I sand. Um, and you put that collage paper on there because you were like totally in love with something on the collage paper. Well, the minute you start sanding, you're gonna probably rip off the entire design. At least that's what's happened to me. So then I realized, you know, if, if I love, um, for example, on this one, I loved <laughs> this word musings because not only do I love the word, but it's the palette that I have here. I was like, whoa. So if I put gloss medium over this first and then sand it, um, a lot of this would rip off when I sand it. Whereas if I sand it now, very gently, right? Just, just don't be too heavy handed. You don't need to, to kill the darn thing because you'll lose everything. But just a little bit of sanding. You know, for those who like old walls and things like that. So be careful because you don't want to like, you know, destroy it. Um, I love to get the edges and um, I will go over this paper, kind of a circular motion. I will put more pressure if I feel like it, you know, like I just put a little bit more pressure down here. Notice that I'm not, you know, I'm not going like this. It's really flat to the surface. and. Um, Okay, and then sometimes you get this happen. That's okay. If it peels back, you can always get, if, it, if you happen to peel your paper back, you can always put a little dab of 
gel medium under it and get it to sit back down again. That's not a problem. Or you might want it to just rip off because you can always paint over it. So I'm going to hit this paper first. Get it a little distressed, and I'm liking that a lot. Now, over here, I stuck this on at the very last because it's collage paper, and this is actually really much heavier than this. So there are different thicknesses of collage paper. This one is more like true cardstock, and the neat thing about this is it has a texture. That's why I put it here, and I'll show you how quickly and how easy it is. To bring out that texture now it might be too much right if it is it's okay let's try to yeah you can see the texture of that paper there but the color was right and so then um again the edges are something i'll do go around it like this and then i'll kind of get the corners And sometimes I'll notice a little edge that pops up, like I was just sanding and something popped up. Um, but, you know, if it pops up, that just, you know, you put a little bit of gel medium underneath it. Um, here. And this shape down here is like my little um, blimp or torpedo, whatever. I don't know why I like it. I just do. So I had a lot of tearing happen there, but that's okay. Like... You know, if something tears, that's oh, that that's what came up. If it tears, you know, you've got paint. You can easily like either fill it in with a, a same color or different color. And then you also have different thicknesses of paint, right? So now it's been distressed. And what I'll do is I'll take uh, my little. This is kind of a cool. It's just a brush, you know, for getting the crumbs off. And then I'll I'll take my dustpan and put it in the garbage um, just again keep your surface kind of clean if you can getting back to this one again uh like i i just have to mentally like remember what's what i what i put on here this is paint and the thicker the paint is you know the more you might have to sand um this is paper paper paint over paper so again the reason i like the paint over the paper is because this is a pretty large shape and if I start to sand it gently like this, the whole reason I did this in a playful way, like I didn't plan it, you know, I didn't plan, um, I don't know how it's gonna look when I sand it, but I do have painted long enough to know that when I put paint over uh, collage paper, that when I sand it back, I get some unexpected things. So I love surprises. Who doesn't, I guess, but um, see what I love about this. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Yeah, I was trying really hard to get rid of the pink. So guys, that's the sanding part of it. Uh, yeah, these wooden panels, Lisa and I are definitely like in love with Rexart, um, both their panels and their frames. And yes, I can show you one uh, real soon here, but um, I have learned to gesso both sides of a wooden panel now. Um, it's not that it'll become you know perfectly flat, but it will be flatter. Not that that's even really a problem because if they're eighth inch thick, um, a little bit of warpage, um, you know, with the frame. Let me just grab a frame real quick. And again, they come in two um, different uh, depths. I should say depth here. This is the thinner one. And so the cool thing is that you know, if, if you're if you're framing something for your grandchild, you might go for the this one, or you just you know you're on a budget. If you want to splurge a little bit and you get the deeper one, you know it's a little bit nicer museum. It like has a museum quality look to it. But in any case, you know you you have a choice. I I don't see this doesn't have an R on it, and this one does. I bought this panel on Amazon. Look how it's not square, and therefore it doesn't fit. Now I can trim it to get it to fit, but this is a Rex frame. And they make their own panels. And guess what? Why that's nice? Because they, their panels fit. So Amazon does not, you know, who, whoever, like, I don't know what company I got these from, but they're not square. I mean, these frames um, that Rexart made are perfectly square and they make their panels so you know they're going to fit. And that's, of course, the best thing. Okay, so that Rex. I put an R in the back because see, they actually fit. If your panel's not completely flat, um, you put this in the frame and then you put a piece of wax paper, freezer paper, whatever, and then put weight on it 
overnight. And now it's going to, even if it was warped a little bit, you just like the frame is going to help it now. You just added the cradle to the board. All right. Um, so I'm going to glaze this now. And before I glaze it, I just want to make sure that like, you know, do I want to score it anymore? And sometimes I do. So one of my favorite things to do is to take my awl and, and it's, you know, like sharp, but you can use a nail if you don't have a tool like this. Um, I, I feel like I get kind of um, aggressive with my artwork. <laughs> Go like this. Now, the, when I do it right before I glaze, it's like I'm just going through the gloss medium all the way down to the board, usually. And I've got other lines that may have gotten filled with gloss medium, and I might want to um, bring those back a bit because that's what gloss medium will do is it'll fill in. So, <clears throat> and again, this is a panel. This is not paper. Um, I wouldn't score on paper. And as far as sanding on paper, you could sand on paper if you're super careful. Wouldn't be too heavy handed with that. And okay. But again, this works. Everything I'm doing as far as the process, you can glaze and sand with uh, oil and cold wax medium or with acrylic mixed media. So sometimes I'll just add a few lines here. Um, then I take my glaze and I'm going to use this nickel azo gold, which is now light gold because it's um, going to become rarer. And I could put it on straight like this, but um, I I like to go from like this, start with less. So this is um, just airbrush medium. This is how I'm going to thin it out. And you can use just water if you don't have airbrush medium, but um, I just like, I don't know, I have it. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to shake this a little bit and put some, just a few drops in here. You don't need a whole lot. And then I'm just going to use my gloved hand to rub it on the surface because why not? Keep in mind though, that I did sand the edges. So I kind of wanted, and here's where I gouged it again, that all, and I want to make sure it gets into that little gouge mark and, you know, just kind of enjoy the process. It's just a chance to get a little messy. It's good to have gloves on. You can obviously spread this with a paper towel or a brush. Now I'm going to take a blue shop towel, but it doesn't have to be a blue shop towel. It can be anything. And you want to like, you know, really, I'm going to remove almost, you know, most of this here. And that's, if, if you put it on really heavy, uh, like full strength, and, and then you're not like aware, obviously, that it's setting up on you. I mean, you're going to be in for a big surprise. So you want to get it off while it's still wet. Um, you can always put on more, but keep in mind that the thicker it is, um, if you don't like it, the more work you're going to have ahead of you. So I tend to go with, I'd rather go with multiple really thin glazes um, rather than one heavy handed one. Now there's not going to be a huge difference here, but I just wanted to show you that that's what I would do. And I put warm over this. Um, there's a lot of cool in it, but now the, the, this cool area here and here, you know, and if I want to reemphasize that a bit, I might sand this. And if you sand this, even after you glaze, you can put more glaze on it. The glaze will, um, be absorbed into the paper a little bit more but you got to be a little careful um that's why you don't you don't want to do it over a painting that has no gloss medium on it because um what would happen is if i were to put this glaze over this now um because i sanded this uh paint and it went all the way down to um the paper here it would fill in the exposed paper of the collage and be like really dark because it's like a sponge and you could then sand it again and maybe get it back to where it was. But this just isn't protected. Um, and so you would just have kind of like, this is all paper exposed and that this, this glaze would completely soak into the paper and make it brown. You have to be aware that uh, paper is like a sponge. And so all the places I've got exposed paper, it's like, yeah, give me some paint. I want to hold on to it. And it will. So unless you put a clear coat of this gloss medium or matte medium on it, um, you don't, I mean, necessarily want to glaze. You can, it'd be a different effect though. I mean, it's not that you can't do it. You just have a different effect. Okay. So that's basically the demo for today.